Okay, now we're going to start our um, renal series. So this is, we're going to um, do chapters, I think it's 54 and 55. This is a little bit of a long lecture, so I'll try to break it up into sections for you. Um, there's, there's quite a bit to talk about when we're talking about the kidneys, also known as your beans. So um, let's start out with the renal urological system. So when, when you hear the renal system, usually people will just call it the renal system. Um, and they're referring to the whole thing. But, but there are two different branches of medicine, one being renal, and that's just kidneys, one being urology, and that's just um, the bladder and urethra. But lots of times when you hear renal, it includes um, the kidneys, the ureters, the bladder, and the urethra. And there's a lot that can go wrong um, along that pathway, and that's what we're gonna talk about today. One thing that I want you to remember, and I'm sure you learned this in um, anatomy, is the, the there's, there's not a ton of differences in male and females from the kidneys, the ureters, and the bladder until you hit the urethra. Look at the length of a man's urethra and the, compared to the length of a female urethra. And this is a classic reason why females are at much higher risk for developing urinary tract infections. Um, okay, that's just a little bit of overview. Let's start with the bladder stuff. So when we're talking about the bladder, um, there's, there's certain things. The bladder is not a super complicated organ. It doesn't do a lot of stuff. It's basically just a reservoir for urine that the kidneys produce. So there's not a ton of stuff that can go wrong there, um, but but the things that we watch for is um, urinary retention. A lot of people have difficulty completely emptying their bladder. That's problematic because when urine stays in the bladder for too long, um, bacterial growth can occur leading to infections. Um, men that have um, prostate enlargement, and we'll talk about this during the reproductive week, uh, they can have urinary retention. So, so what you need to do is figure out what the cause is. And there's a lot of different causes that can cause somebody to retain urine. Now, your, your um, kidneys should be producing about 30 milliliters of urine every hour, and that will just drip down into the reservoir. Um, and what you wanna do is um, keep, keep the patient well hydrated. The patient should be voiding about every three to four hours is ideal. Another thing is when you empty the bladder a lot, you, you tend to flush out more bacteria and that reduces the risk for urinary tract infections. Sometimes the cause for um, bladder reten urinary retention in the bladder can be temporary. For example, post anesthesia. Um, this is very common when people are waking up from, from anesthesia, um, the nerves aren't, aren't complete, that innervate the bladder are not fully awake yet, you can, can retain some urine. Um, uh, women postpartum because the area is very swollen they can they can tend to retain urine so if it's just a short-term thing like that it's an easy just do a real quick intermittent straight cath another rule of thumb for nurses anytime that you can do an intermittent straight cath versus an indwelling foley catheter you go with the intermittent straight cath because again the indwelling foley catheter is at much higher risk for developing a urinary tract infection Sometimes the urinary retention is because of a long-term um, problem that cannot be corrected. For example, spinal cord injuries, um, a neurogenic bladder like with your um, MS patients can get a neurogenic bladder where it's just they can't identify the innervation so they, they can't determine that the bladder is full. Those patients tend to have urinary retention. And there's a couple different things that they can do for there. There are certain um, techniques you can teach your patient how to um, train the bladder. Like for example, you can teach them to go to the bathroom every you know two to four hours, whether they feel like they have to go or not. Just go sit on a toilet, kind of like when you're training a toddler. You just put them on there, whether they can state they have to go or not. Um, and but certain things like a spinal cord injury patient will not. There's there's you cannot retrain that. So if they're a paraplegic and they've got good use of their arms, you might be able to teach them to straight cat themselves. Um, or if, if they have a caregiver or loved one, then the loved one can straight cat them cute, you know, four hours or something like that. Um, the straight cat, the one thing I did want to point out about straight catting, um, 
When you are inserting a Foley catheter, an indwelling Foley catheter, it must be done under aseptic technique, sterile technique. The reason is if you're introducing bacteria up through the urethra into the bladder, you will develop a urinary tract infection. That's why Caudi's um, uh, catheter associated urinary tract infections are such a huge problem in hospitals and we're trying to reduce the incidence of Caudi's. Um, because uh, it leads to UTIs, increased bacteria, a patient can get urosepsis, which means they, they're septic because of an infection coming out of the urological system. So when you're in the hospital and you're putting a, a, any catheter in, any catheter, it is done under aseptic technique. That includes indwelling Foley catheters and intermittent straight catheters because we are in the hospital, hospitals are filled with bacteria, there's a lot of cross-contamination going on, so we don't want to run the risk of any bacteria um, uh, infections, so we use aseptic technique. However, if your patient is going to go home, if you're going to teach them how to do intermittent straight cath on themselves, now it's easy for men to do this on themselves, it's very difficult for a woman to do this on themselves, but they can learn with mirrors and things like that. Um, but when they are at home, it's done under clean technique. And so patients will get, you can order it through medical supplies, they can get the intermittent straight cath. Um, they clean the area just with some warm soapy water. They, they clean the catheters and the catheters can actually be reused. Um, there's a cleaning agent and then they can, they can reuse them because, and then, you know, it's just, if at home, the environment is a little bit cleaner, you teach them how to clean. And then of course you're gonna monitor for um, your urinary tract infections because anytime you're inserting things in and out of the urethra you're at risk for developing um, an infection but those are two differences you need to know as a nurse like so if you're working in the community setting you teach clean technique if you're working in a hospital setting you teach a um, aseptic to, or you use aseptic technique when you are catheterizing somebody in the hospital um, so this is a little bit off the screen but yeah we just watch for infections I think I already talked about that um, another thing oh did I, yeah okay so let me uh, sort of back with urinary retention when a person voids um, and you probably all had an opportunity to do this in your clinical setting is to do a bladder scan it's super simple there's just like a little scan that you put over the bladder um, when a person voids um, and when they they it feels like their bladder is empty um, everybody will have a little bit of residual urine in there and anywhere between 50 and 100 uh, milliliters of urine is completely within normal limits. That's completely fine. When you're getting up higher than 100 milliliters left in the bladder after the person says that they voided and feels like it's empty, then that's called urinary retention. Then you might have to um, intervene and figure out what else is going on and what might be causing that. Another thing that we talk about with um, bladder is incontinence. Um, and incontinence just means an involuntary loss of urine um, for a variety of reasons. Now a lot of people think that as a person ages, this is a normal process of aging. That's not a true statement. Um, it is, it's not associated with aging, nor is it a disease. So you, so if somebody's incontinent, you, you, they can't, you just can't claim that they have this, this disease. It's not. It's a symptom of something else. Um, so figure out, figure out what the problem is. And there's a million reasons somebody can be incontinent of urine. Um, as somebody ages, if they have a urinary tract infection, uh, they might not um, feel it as much as a younger person. Uh, we're going to talk about some signs and symptoms of UTIs, uh, but as a person ages, um, and the, if they had previously been continent, all of a sudden they're incontinent now, they might, have a, they might have a UTI, a bladder infection. Um, they could have um, dehydration. Sometimes um, fecal impaction can cause it. Certain medications can cause incontinence, like sedatives, so the person is more sleepy. Um, the diuretics um, will fill the bladder up quicker, and, and a person may have uh, weakened um, uh, pelvic muscle vasculature. Women that have had um, a lot of children, this is um, more common in. Um, obese patients because there's, they're putting a, pre a lot of pressure on there, um, that's more common. Some of the anticholinergic medications, patients who are um, in bed, who have got restricted mobility, who can't get up and get to the bathroom as quickly, those patients are going to be um, incontinent. So 
figure out what the problem is and then fix the problem. You might have to adjust the medication. You might have to do some bladder retraining. You might have to teach the patient how to do Kegels exercises um, to strengthen the pelvic floor. Stress incontinence um, occurs when somebody coughs or sneezes and they, they expel a little bit of urine. This is common in, uh, especially in um, women and as women age, the more children they've had. The, and that's really because the muscles of the pelvic floor are weakening. So you, these Kegel exercises, um, and you can do the way you do a Kegel exercise is the muscles, like in your pelvic area, there's those, the bones that kind of make that triangle. And those muscles, you can, you can kind of tense them up and release them and, and so if you do that you know about 10 times every hour you, and you can feel it, it if, if you don't know what I'm talking about next time you go to urinate when you sit down to urinate try to stop this the urine stream that's that that um, exercise I'm talking about that's a Kegels exercise so when you're teaching your patient um, how to strengthen those muscles that is that's the muscle stretch that you would teach them to do common after um, vaginal surgeries, uh, bladder surgeries, um, men that have had prostatectomies and prostate surgeries, so things like that, um, MS patients, you may have to, to retrain. So, um, and if the, if the patient has a UTI in their incontinent, fix the problem, get them on antibiotics, um, treat that, and sometimes the incontinence will um, improve. Okay, so the next thing about the bladder is UTIs, and I've been mentioning that quite a bit um, already because UTIs um, are a, a huge nursing uh, problem, like a problem that we deal with. Um, so number one nursing priority is um, prevention. We absolutely want to prevent somebody from developing UTI, so we need to teach them strategies to prevent that. One thing, if somebody is um, constantly getting recurrent UTIs, check their diet, find out what they're eating. Um, because if they have a diet that's, that's alkaline, and uh, you may have heard that like people who have UTIs like, oh, drink more cranberry juice. Cranberry juice actually is more alkaline. You want the patient um, having a higher, a higher acid in their diet, so things like like your citruses, so uh, like um, orange juice is really good, and if they're not getting enough vitamin C in their diet, they can they can um, have a vitamin C like about a uh, thousand milligrams a day, and you can get that easily over the counter. It's super cheap, so that's a way to prevent UTIs. Um, you should be teaching your female clients after they've gone to the bathroom, they need to wipe from front to back, not back to front. When you're wiping from back to front the E. coli from the fecal matter in the rectum area, you can drag that up into the urethra area and the bacteria tracks right up into the urethra and hence you've got another UTI. So just, just good training. Um, women, this is especially true of women, just again because of the, sh the shortened um, urethra. It can happen in men too. They should, so, so people that are um, prone to getting uh, urinary tract infections, they should not take baths, they should shower, um, and swimmers are more prone to this because they're underwater constantly. Um, so patients that complain of constant UTIs, you might have to assess their lifestyle and alter some of that if they can. You want to keep the patient very well hydrated. Um, dehydrated patients, the bacteria can tend to grow. You want them to urinate quite a bit. So again, if you're keeping them hydrated, they're going to have to go to the bathroom more often and then they can empty their bladder, which reduces the um, likelihood of getting a urinary tract infection. Um, make sure that they're fully emptying the bladder because residual urine that just kind of stays in there tends to um, concentrate bacterial growth. Um, always use straight catheters over indwelling catheters um, whenever that's possible. So you do want to, this is how you prevent it, then how do you know that it's, a, that it's actually occurring? In most people, the first sign is painful urination. So when, the, when a patient will go to urinate, it burns and it hurts really bad. That's a classic sign. And then, the, then you can get um, a UA, urinalysis, so you have the patient pee in a cup, and that will typically show uh, white blood cells um, if the patient has a urinary tract infection, and you just quickly put your patient on a, an antibiotic, and Bactrim is the drug of choice, um, or Cipro, and, um, 
either one of those, it's usually just a three-day course of back and recipro and typically then the UTI goes away. Um, sometimes in your elderly patients, they won't have that painful urination, they, don't, they kind of lose that. Um, and so incontinence might be the first sign that they have a UTI and you need to identify that early because if you don't, that, it, that your patient who is just incontinent and it does not have normal symptoms of UTI can develop urosepsis. So you need to be a little bit more careful of that in your patients who are elderly. Um, you can check their blood, uh, blood count for elevated white blood cell count. You'll remember that normal white blood cell count is four to 10. Um, units per um, million. So anything above that, I mean thousand, anything above four to ten thousand, now we're starting to get um, higher white blood cell counts and that's an, an uh, indication that your patient might have a UTI. Person might just not feel good, they might um, be a little bit anorexia, have anorexia meaning like they don't want to eat, they might have um, a fever, they might, and then you can do a UA, they might have some sediment in the, in the urine, they might have white blood cells in the urine, they could have a little bit of bleeding in the urine. Um, so identify, figure out what your signs, is, prevent it first, figure out what your signs and symptoms are, and then treat it, treatment of choice, like I said, is uh, usually a three-day course of uh, Bactrim or Cipro, depending on the provider's um, choice. Now the next thing I wanted to talk about re regarding the bladder is bladder cancer. Not super common and it's not the most horrible cancer to have. Not the best. I mean it's not as easy as, as like a colon cancer or um, you know stage one breast cancer um, in somebody over 65 but it's it's much more um, common in patients who are smokers. It uh, tends to run in families a little bit. Um, some signs and symptoms that it's, sh it's showing up. Classic symptom of bladder cancer is hematuria, blood in the urine that is not painful. So if you remember, UTIs, like I just said, they can have bleeding in there, but it's painful, it's, it hurts. Hematuria without pain, um, it, that's a little, you're a little bit more nervous when that is occurring. The reason is the problem is up in here um, and you're peeing it out rather than UTI is usually an inflammation and infection because the bacteria will start here and climb up the urethra that way. Um, so if your patient is developed, they might pee a lot, they might have low back pain. Um, so start, start doing some assessment, figure out have they, do they smoke now, have they ever been a smoker, anybody in the family ever had a history of bladder cancer. Uh, Long-term catheter use, so people that, that use catheters quite a bit are a little bit higher risk for bladder cancer. People who have had radiation um, to that area, uh, you know, so if they've had radiation to the prostate or something like that, sometimes they can have um, higher incidence of bladder cancer. And certain waters, certain waters that have higher levels of arsenic um, and some chemicals like, you know, those, the, um, like the Flint water crisis thing. I, you know, contaminate, I, I don't know if that's causing bladder cancer, but contaminated water can sometimes lead to a higher incidence of bladder cancer. Um, so you treat this kind of, of cancer, like pretty much like you would any other cancer, um, they can operate, they can go in. Now it really matters what kind of cancer, like if you have um, a tumor in situ, remember this is like a, a beginning stage um, almost not even a full malignancy, but but like a like a plasia, like a you know like the cells are becoming ugly, but they're not quite cancer yet. They would just go in and remove this section, um, all the way up to tumor uh, grade one, two, three, and four is where it's going all the way through. Now we're going into the adjacent organs. Um, so hopefully they can identify it early. Another problem is where it's located. So the way that they identify, like this picture here is done on cystoscopy, and I'm going to show you what a cystoscopy is in a, in a minute, but it's just a camera that's looking up into the bladder. Well, this is very obvious right here that there's a problem, that there's a malignancy. If the tumor is growing under, under the epithelial lining, like if it's starting over in here, a cystoscopy is not going to show. Show it. So then you would have to do something, um, another diagnostic study, which I'm going to show you what some of those look like. Um, and then I'm going to show you once they do the surgeries, what are some of the kinds of um, restructuring of the bladder um, to fix this problem. Okay, so that's bladder stuff. Um, and I, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop it here.
and then we'll pick it back up and we'll do some kidney stuff so we'll do this in stages so it's a little bit shorter for you so stay tight